We are uh, filming some interviews with some of uh, the United States of America's greatest jazz artist for Hamilton College. We're very privileged to have two members of the Count Basie Orchestra with us today. We have Frank Foster and Bill Hughes. My name is Mike Woods and uh, I'm a professor at Hamilton College and my colleague Monk Rowe, who teaches saxophone also at the college. <clears throat> I'd like to start and ask you guys some questions about the Basie Band and how it got started. Tell us how the Basie Band kind of evolved out of the, the Benny Moten Band. Yeah, well, uh, Basie uh, was playing the piano in that band, of course. <coughs> and uh, uh, sometime down the line, uh, Benny died. And the guys decided they wanted to get something going. And they formed a group. I think it was a small group at that point. But they decided uh, that they wanted Basie to do the out front thing. And that's, that's really how he came to be the band leader. I don't think he'd planned that at all. But it uh, happened that all the guys liked him, you know, so they chose him to, to uh, be the front man. That's pretty generally how he got started being a band leader. Of course, it's a little more involved than that. But uh, he, uh, I guess he had the type personality that uh, all the guys figured they could live with that, you know, mm -hmm. and beating the band. Thought he was easy going, so yeah. he became a leader. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he stayed that way throughout his career. He was uh -huh. always easy going, you know. He was always the chief. And, uh, you, you would ask him uh, uh, about being the band leader, and he'd say, I'm just a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> How did he get that nickname, Chief? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember when that first came into play. I think that uh, started back in either in the late 50s or, yeah, it was the late 50s. Late 50s? started calling him yeah, Chief. Yeah, because uh, early 50s, I'm pretty sure we weren't calling him Chief. But none of us ever called him Count. Okay. That, that was no, how people no, uh, would come up to him, you know, lay people would come and say, hello, Count. We but, would call uh, him Bass. We, we called him Bass. Yeah. Wasn't there an yeah. album with uh, a picture of a train? Yeah. And him on the front? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that Super was. Chief. Super, Super Chief. Chief, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was called Chief long before that album yeah, came okay. out. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that, that made, uh, for you guys, the the bassy rhythm section, such a, I, I just like a, you know, the thing to strive for made that uh, something about the sound of the band. Was, was was there something specific that those guys were doing? Well, I, I really can't say that there was uh, something specific they were doing differently from anyone else. It's just the feeling that they got. And I think it started with Basie himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, agree. With his simplicity <laughs> piano style. And uh, very understated, and uh, and a very happy feeling. When he first went to Kansas City and he heard this happy music and he fell in love with it and he wanted to be a part of it, well, he that feeling just just osmosed into him and he osmosed it back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And and when they finally added on Freddie Green, Basie was able to give up a lot of stuff with his left hand mm -hmm. and please just. Tinkle, you know, while Freddie was going on with the straight 4-4, four four, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's, uh, when did Freddie join? 1937. I don't know what month that was, but he joined in 1937. Yeah. Uh, a, a guy named John Hammond mm -hmm. yeah. recommended that basically go down, go down and hear him. Did he go down to some club and hear him? Uh, I'm not sure. I thought he just recommended, just that, recommended he, that he be a part of it. That's all I know. Yeah. And I think at that time, was, was, was it Fess Williams that was playing? He, uh, was Fiddler Williams. Fiddler Williams, I'm sorry. Or uh, it wasn't uh, Eddie Durham, was it? I don't Fiddler. think Eddie was playing uh, guitar at that point. If he Maybe did, not. it was just occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Fiddler Williams, that, that's who he was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Fiddler Williams is, is a very uh, brilliant violinist. Yes, he is. He is that. He really got that swing. <laughs> All the way. 
Let me ask you uh, both to kind of chime in on this question. You know, the bassy sound is a sound that comes out of the, the Southwest. And people say that that sound is different than the sound that was coming off the East Coast or the West Coast for that matter. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think the sound was different or the feel or the tunes that you played, or the way that the tunes were structured was different than the East Coast, let's say? Well, I think uh, when, you, when you speak of, of different sounds evolving from different sections of the country, I think you have to take into account the whole, uh, the, the feeling that people are, are giving out in that area, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, music, especially this music, being a music of feeling. When those people come uh, uh, to play, they all they do is like they're exhibiting those feelings that they've picked up all day long. So mm -hmm. when, consequently, if it's in the Southwest or wherever, if you, if you got that Southwest feeling, Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's going to come out on the end of that horn, mm -hmm. you know. And if you're in L.A. and you got that L.A. feel, I think L.A. has always been a little laid back kind of an area. So mm -hmm. out there, the jazz has always been kind of laid back, you know. And you'll East find, Coast. Yeah, oh, East go Coast. Ahead. Go ahead, Foss, because the East they're, Coast is the... So they're the sophisticates were on the East yeah. Coast. That music was uh, classy and elegant mm -hmm. and uh, elaborately orchestrated. And, and slick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So out in the Southwest, uh, simplicity, like but... simplicity, yeah. uh, happiness, that happy feeling, uh, sort of a carefree feeling and a loose, a looser thing than, the, you know, just like loosening your tie as opposed to being all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after hours, get down. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Hell, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you something that I seem to have noticed this. Now, just tell me, am I right? <clears throat> After listening to many, many, many Basie albums, there's very few tunes in minor keys. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. Seems like back in the early 50s, we played quite a few yes, minor in things, the, you know? In the early 50s, and then and going back to the 40s, <clears throat> there were several... Uh, more perhaps mm. than we did in the 60s and 70s and 80s because uh topsy was one of them uh what's that thing uh, uh tickle weird. toe yeah tickle toe tickle toe by prez was one of them and there was one uh, i can't think the names of any of those oh, wow, they still kind of sounded up though they yeah sound they, they yeah. sounded happy no yeah, matter what yeah they were minor key happy too yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right well i never thought about it from that yeah. perspective but they did sound cheerful Cheerfully minor. <laughs> can you uh, can you uh, give our our future viewers an idea of what what a head arrangement was like? I mean, how that kind of thing happened. Back then? Well, a head arrangement probably started with one idea or motif, if you will, uh, that uh, was expressed by one or the other of the sections, maybe the saxophones, like for instance, uh, jumping to the woodside. But yeah. Then the brass <clears throat> sort of punctuated the uh, licks that came out of the saxophone section. And then they, they interwove these things. And any section could be the source of one of these riffs or licks that was the main uh, melodic statement in the song. And everybody else just knew how to f fall in line and do something to enhance that melody. Yeah. And with were some uh, of those arrangements done without being written out? Oh, with definitely. totally without being written Except out. Most it's definitely. That's a concept uh, that, that uh, is, is kind of lost now. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. Every now and then you go, we go to play behind a singer or something, and we'll have to do what they call set riffs. You know, you set a riff, which is behind the blues is fairly simple because one guy yeah. just picks up his horn and he does something and it sounds pretty good and everybody just joins in on that. Now, to emphasize the thing, you, most times you do it in unison to start with, and then mm -hmm. that, about the third or fourth chorus, guys go into a little harmonic thing on it, you know, 
and you and just know it. what you just know how to catch your pitch off of that. Oh yeah, oh definitely. You know, you know exactly what everybody can in. figure out uh, what part he's to play. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. depending on the the position in the section in the that's right uh -huh. in the orchestra, yeah. like. Yeah. If so you, if you uh, hear the lead alto do something and you the second alto, you're going to play about a third below that. Yeah, yeah. we'll play yeah, a third you know below that. Be, yeah, you know <laughs> you're going to be under him. You don't go over him. The first tenor or second or a third under that. The second tenor, a second or a third under the, uh, uh -huh. in the, in the baritone can either double what the first alto has done or pick some low tonic, some low uh -huh. root sound. Uh -huh. make it, that give it that heavy sound. The same thing happens in the trumpet and trombone sections. You know, but that to me, it seems like it would make for exciting music where the players themselves don't know everything that's going to happen when the tune starts. <laughs> well, yeah, they have been known to build into some, mm, some yeah. exciting moments, yeah. yeah. So no doubt about yeah, that. That's a great feeling when that happens. Uh, it's not, like you said, it's not as prevalent now because the younger guys are not that acquainted with that kind of a thing. You know, they've come to schools and... Uh, outfits where they don't do that much yeah. uh, riffing, we call it. But uh, back during the 50s when I joined this band, and even before I joined this band, you know, like, uh, you had to be able to let set some kind of riffs in order to make a gig. Exactly. <coughs> uh, at some point or another, every now and then, one would write out an arrangement, a written arrangement, and then leave space open during solo sections for riffs to be, yeah, that's to right, be that's right. uh, done behind solos. That's true. That's hardly done anymore either. Mm -hmm. uh, it slips my mind to do it. I, I'm so taken with orchestration and yeah. textures and colors that I want to fill it up with everything <laughs> that comes out of my head. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to get back to that, letting the fellows help with these head sections of, of yeah, written kinda, arrangements. Kind of got to let go a little bit and, and yeah. let them do some Because that's what, that's what this band did in the early days. Man, there were a lot of head arrangements when I first came in this band. <laughs> <laughs> like, where's the music, like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Was it, when you, like, if a band that does head, head arrangements like that, is it a lot harder for a new guy to come into the band and, and find his place? It depends on the new guy himself. Yeah, it depends on where he's springing from, you know. If he sprung from uh, Berkeley College or something like that, it's going to be difficult for him, you know, because he's been uh, well versed in the written music, you know. And the minute you take him away from there, you're saying, what the hell is going <laughs> on? <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot to be said for the ears, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. You have to have an ear so yeah. that you can catch up on a riff or a lick the f after the first time it's played. Yeah. The guy who sets the riff plays it the first time. The second time, the whole section plays it. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's got to be there. Verbatim. Uh, let me ask you a question about this. <clears throat> Is this true they said that in between tunes, Basie would just start playing the piano and you all wouldn't always know what tune was going to come next? Yes. Very That's true. Right. <laughs> Very <laughs> true. He would play, he would just fiddle around while he's trying to think of a tune. Uh -huh. He might be looking you dead in the face. Uh -huh. That's right. And you think he's looking at, oh, he's looking at me. And he's looking he's at you abstractly, he's gonna not play. even thinking about <laughs> wow. what he's looking at, but uh -huh. thinking about what he's going to, what song it's going to be. And most times he'd be humming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so then he'd think of something and he'd go into an intro which we all knew what the intros were, right. you know. Yeah. But it would be so smooth that the people would wonder, well, how the hell did they get from that to that tune, you know? At some point during his meanderings, we would know exactly what the tune was going to be. And some of them had similar introductions. Yeah. Uh oh Like <laughs> Down for the Count had the same kind of introduction as another song it was in A-flat. Uh, clink, 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 clink. Clean. I don't know what it was, but yeah. there were two songs that had similar introductions. But somehow, when it came time to hit letter A, you knew which song it was yeah. going to be. Yeah. That was like amazing. I, I still can't figure that out. Yeah. Now John Hurd told us that his first night on the band, <laughs> AC did that, 
and <laughs> he didn't he knew. Know where he's going, he's saying, what's the tune? And one guy told him it's number four, and one guy told him it's number 11. One guy told him it's number, you guys don't do that, would you? Of course, when he said he couldn't read music anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not talking about John Hurd. I think he was John Hurd. Yeah. John Hurd. Yeah. John had well, a good time while he was here. Uh, but but uh, going back to that, when they're setting up the intros like that, and a new guy comes on the band, okay, so he maybe doesn't know this routine. Um, did w did you guys ever, uh, when the new guy is sitting there saying, "Oh, what tune is it?" You know, did you generally bail him out by helping him what tune, or did you sabotage oh, yeah, him once in a while? Oh no, <laughs> no guys he, 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 he didn't even have to ask. Yeah, did you guys? <laughs> as soon as Basie started, in, as soon as it was known what tune it was, it's a uh, corner pocket. Well, or, or whatever. <laughs> uh, we didn't what? like to, there's, the idea of sabotaging someone was was taboo because that mm -hmm. would that would affect the overall sound of uh -huh. the band. It might displease Basie, uh -huh, uh -huh. and and uh, someone in the audience might pick it up. And yeah. Say, well, they they're not two together, are they? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. So that was even if you didn't like somebody, someone uh -huh. personally, the idea of sabotaging. That's, that, what did happen sometimes is if Basie felt like he, he was taking a little long getting to what we call a joiner. Doom, 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 doom. He would go into it a little fast before, you know, the guy could find the music. And mm -hmm. you, you're scuffling trying to play your part and tell him, tell the guy next to you if he's new, you know, what number to get up. And in that case, you see the guy scrambling, you know, and he's not able to play until he gets the part up. Wow. But what? it's not a sabotage thing at all. Yeah. Were there other more acceptable forms of humor in the band? Oh, oh yeah, yes, <laughs> certainly. Uh, you want to you want to start that one, Bill? <laughs> More acceptable forms of humor. <laughs> well, one of the uh, one of the queerest things that I ever went through on the on the bandstand was uh, if you stood up to take a solo in place in this band. Generally, when you sat down, there was some kind of a mute. <laughs> <laughs> a plunger. A plunger or something. <laughs> and you get this immediate goose when you sit there. <laughs> and naturally the house falls apart, yeah. you know. Yeah. But uh, that's just one of the things that comes to mind. Bass like to uh, call a, a feature if someone came in slightly inebriated uh, or late. Or late, especially late. Yeah, I, 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 my punctuality <laughs> habits were horrible in those days. So I'd come in late, and he would call uh, either Little Pony or Jumping at the Woodside, and I'd have to rise to the occasion immediately. Uh -huh. And if something happened, my reed was too dry, and I might squeak during the performance, basically be the first one to break up and fall off the stool laughing. <laughs> and the uh, almost embarrassing, almost most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me uh, was uh, in Manchester, it was either Manchester or Birmingham, England. I can't remember. Yeah, which. I was going to bring that up. Folks. But I, I lost my dress shoes. We had a, we had a brown and tan tux, and I lost my brown dress shoes. Misplaced them. They weren't lost. Maybe Barracuda got them or something. <laughs> I don't, I don't but anyway, think so. <laughs> by concert time, I had no dress shoes, and with this brown and tan tuxedo, I had uh, some blue and white sneakers. So <laughs> when it came time for me to take a solo, a, a big solo. Uh, on short solos, one might stand up in front of one stand and just play like eight measures mm -hmm. and sit down. But on long extended solos, every, you always came out to the microphone. Well, with these blue and white sneakers on, this, this, this <laughs> brown and tan tuxedo, I didn't want to come out into the microphone. So I tried to, I s stood up at my stand and played my solo. And Charlie folks, the baritone saxophones would hear, wouldn't have none of this. So he <laughs> coolly, very coolly, just pulled my bandstand out from in front of me. And thousands of people saw a fellow playing a tennis solo with brown and tan tuxedo and blue and white sneakers. And everybody in the band broke up, the audience broke up, and basically, he did his usual falling off the stool. 
Now, as another time, Foss, you remember oh, yeah. Titus Turner? Yeah, I remember <laughs> Titus Turner. <laughs> wow. Titus was a, a singer of mm. sorts, and uh, he was performing with the band. And I don't know what he did to get everybody upset, but everybody was very upset at Titus. And uh, somebody cooked up the plot. We ain't playing, you know, behind this guy. And I think Marshall kicked off, the, kicked off the tune, and all of a sudden everybody was just sitting there. Oh yeah. Yeah, you don't remember that? No, I don't. Everybody was sitting there, and this Titus was that. so upset he started crying, and basically was dying over there. You know? <laughs> now I remember he was crying. <laughs> I yeah. Didn't remember what happened? The band refused to play for him. Wow. Basically, basically died, and he was looking at me like I told you. <laughs> <laughs> There was this. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. There was a time in Chicago that uh, <clears throat> we played. Uh, it was a Birdland show. We played at the, the Opera House, and the concert started at eight o'clock. And uh, I'd had company that afternoon at the hotel, and uh, at eight o'clock I was just waking up. And the band was playing. No Frank Foster. So I hurriedly got dressed and called a taxi down to the, the theater. And I had got there just in time um, to miss the first half. <laughs> so I walked in after the intermission was over and hurriedly got my horn out. In the meantime, the first song after intermission was a song of Neil Heffy's called Dinner with Friends yeah. that featured a solo break. Like I had about a two major solo break and into the solo. A break is where the horn player or soloist is all by him or herself, you know, and the rhythm section lays out and then they start back at the beginning of the solo. So Frank West was getting prepared to take my solo because uh, ostensibly I hadn't shown yet. And uh, so when it came to this, uh, uh, part in the song was going to be just before the break of sort of an interlude. And as Frank West was standing up ready to play, here I come walking on stage just in time to make the break. <laughs> so and you got it, you got it. Yeah, I, yeah. I took it. This is my solo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so before they cursed me out, they laughed. <laughs> and they cursed me out. Uh, what was it like? Uh, was was there a certain amount of competition for for solo space in the band? I mean, <laughs> not amongst the trombone players. Maybe <laughs> maybe the saxophone players. Yeah, there wasn't a really a feeling of competition no. in the old days. Basically, like to keep something going, like uh, stories of uh, Lester Young and mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Don Bias or. or Buddy Tate not liking one another, but they were all they they really loved each other, you know. Yeah. And but the stories were about the rivalry going on. Well, that was the thing from those days. Though. Yeah. You yeah. know, guys would purposely, you know, uh, go out looking for a session uh -huh. for cutting, for one cutting, particular guy. Yeah. yeah. For those cutting mm. contests, you know. That doesn't happen much anymore, but I mean, they, they would take you through all sorts of scenes, I suppose. You know, changing keys and uh -huh. tunes. And <laughs> if you couldn't hang, you know, you were dead. But I remember this one one particular instance. We were doing a Birdland show. I, now, I don't remember. I remember we flew up to Boston, and we did the show, and then we flew right back into New York. Bird was on the show. You remember oh, yeah. that show? You don't remember that Man, show? Man, I'm so ashamed that I don't remember the show Bird was on. Bird came <laughs> up. Unfortunately, Bird didn't have a horn when he came up. So Bird borrowed the horn from, I think he borrowed uh, Ernie Wilkins' horn. Ernie's? Yeah. Uh -huh. And was something terribly out of whack with the reed as far as Bird was concerned that Ernie was using. Mm -hmm. So every other note that Bird played that night was a squeak, you mm -hmm. know. And I just remember being, you know, like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. Bird. <laughs> but uh, he shot through it like he didn't, you know. 
probably because Bird used a number five, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and Harry used a number two. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. that. I think that's when the uh, when I blotted out from my memory <laughs> conveniently. Yeah, maybe so. That was, that stays on my mind all the time, you know. Let me ask, uh, what is one of the funniest or craziest predicaments that the band has gotten into as a whole since you've been with the band? Well, for me, it was the time that we, uh, we were in Europe, we were traveling around Europe. And I don't remember where we were coming from, but we got to this hall in uh, uh, Paris called the Sao Pael. You remember the Sao Pael? Yeah, Pale? I remember the Sao Pael. Well, we got to the hall. Unfortunately, our instruments didn't. Uh oh. The instruments went to Jamaica somewhere. Yeah, somewhere in the Caribbean or something, you know. It was the music, and was it? Was it the music or the it, instruments? It was the music, or both. And drums and oh, stuff yeah. like that, oh, yeah. you know. And uh, we could, we obviously couldn't play because there, there was some of the, uh, I guess, the baritone, saxophone, and yeah. something else. The drums, maybe. So we were sitting in this hall. And the French fans, you know, they get very upset if things don't go according to plan. So they started to get restless, and we were sitting there waiting on the music. And uh, all of a sudden, it got very loud out there, you know. And uh, Asa said, I think we better get the hell out of here, you know. And we had to slip out a side door because we thought those people were going to attack us, you know. And I don't think they believed that we didn't have any. Oh. Somebody went out there and announced what had happened, you know. But <laughs> it didn't sound right to them, I guess. And uh, we had to slip out of there. And for the next five days, I think, we were off because we didn't have anything to work with. Wow. To me, that was... <laughs> Took that long for the stuff to catch yeah. up with the band. Yeah. yeah. What was it like playing in Europe for the most part? Was it, was it different from, from the States? It seemed so in, in the beginning. Uh, yeah, during that time, I think it was definitely uh, different. How so? I mean, that the people... Well, at that time, I mean, the world wasn't so accessible, mm -hmm. you know. Like, it took us 13 hours to go over there on prop planes. You know, we'd go up, go up by way of Newfoundland, you know, gas up up there, mm -hmm. and then jump across the ocean on the, uh, on the DC-7 or... Uh, what was, it, what was the other? DC-6. DC-6. DC-7 uh, or DC-6. And... Uh, jet flight, jet hadn't come into being. Yeah, I mean... The, prior the, to 1958. Yeah. And and the, the two cultures were, like, totally divided. Right now, when you go over there, you can't feel that much different than you do in the United States, mm -hmm. you know. But at that point, I mean, the language and everything else was just completely different. So it made us feel like we were doing something completely different ourselves because, oh. we, you know, we were hearing all the foreign languages and we were seeing people do things differently than they do them in the United States. We couldn't get a sandwich after about 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was totally different. And the women were more interesting at that point because we were young, I tell you. you know. <laughs> and that, made, <laughs> that made a lot of difference. I don't, don't, don't show this to my wife. I didn't mean that. <laughs> the fans seemed to appreciate the music more. I don't know if, if it was actually true, but it, it, it just seemed as though uh, larger percentages of European audiences really related to the music. And back home, it seemed as though lots of people were saying, yeah, that's all right, what else can you do? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's true. But that's over true. the years, I've found that the United States has sort of caught up as far as audience appreciation of what we do mm -hmm. compared to the European audiences. And even in the latter years of my uh, tour of duty with the orchestra in the uh, after 62, 63, 64, it seemed as though when we went to Europe, uh, we'd see whole families come to concerts, but it may just have been the father who appreciated the music and the rest of the family was just there because he brought them mm -hmm. and maybe he wanted to expose them to this, this uh, 
American cultural uh, entity. Yeah. And it seemed as though a lot of people came out of curiosity. Oh, we've heard about this Count Basie orchestra. Let's go see what it what it's about. Uh, to me, Bill may have a different story, but no, that's, that's the feeling I got. That's pretty in general the, the way I in the mid '60s, it. and uh, this was just prior to the Beatles striking it big and the big beat turning things around. Yeah. Let me tell you a story about the Beatles. We were in Liverpool in 19, early 1964. Yeah. And we went to this little cave-like club, you know. And I guess that was, <clears throat> that was them, you know, playing. Maybe they, they came back later and said it was them anyhow. We were sitting down there listening to this little group play, you know. And, uh, you know, they sounded all right, you know. <laughs> but but I, we didn't, you know, pay that much attention. Mm -hmm. We were really there looking for something else anyhow. And uh, Basie was there. And I remember one of those guys coming up after the set and talking to Basie, asking how he thought they sounded. He said, yeah, you, you know, Basie was always very nice. You guys sound all right, you know. And I think about maybe six months later, these guys were <laughs> coming to New York, taking New York by storm, you know. And I didn't realize then it was That's the right. same group, you know. That's right, they were playing the the cavern or something. But I tell you what they did. They they were so impressed with Basie that that uh, later on down the line they got Basie to do two Beatle albums. I don't know whether you ever heard those. Yes, or not. they did. Basie's yeah. Beetle Bag. Yeah, Basie's Beetle Bag and something one other. I can't remember the names because we never really played the tunes after we after we did the albums. But uh, I remember one of the uh, I can't remember whether it was Lennon or. Somebody else came to the record deep while we were doing them, you know. But they had never forgotten that they said come in and said it sounded good. <laughs> I used to didn't even remember. I was going to ask how those kind of albums came about. Like I know you did one of uh, Hollywood uh, movie themes too. Oh yeah, the, the apartment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one the James Bond. Uh, yeah. I wasn't in the band when these when these. Uh, we were covering. Were we were covering everything that was to cover in the. Yeah. Mid '60s. I mean, you know, like we were doing record dates, like off. A lot of the stuff that we went into the studios and did, we'd sit there, and we'd rehearse it, we'd record it, and that'd be the last time we'd see that music. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was that those uh, kind of throwaway dates that Basie did, and it was all in the name of money. I think at that point. <laughs> yeah, I think he was persuaded by the producers uh, yeah. to do it, and then, but on on the gigs. You never heard it. You never no, heard you it. wouldn't play those tunes. I thought, I personally thought that uh, the James Bond uh, album had the wrong arranger. Who arranged that album? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. It wasn't you though, right? It was, yeah, oh, no, it wasn't me. Yeah, right. <laughs> See, because a lot of these things were done and, and it seemed as though uh, it was hard to fit, fit the concept of the bassy uh, style behind these charts, and uh, they just didn't come off. And the person who did the arranging was outside the band, of course, and didn't really know Basie's personal form. I don't formula. remember who, who recorded. I mean, uh, who wrote that album? You don't, or you do? No, I don't. I don't recall who wrote it. I, I remember, remember doing the album. Mm -hmm. You know, that leads that leads to another thought is the fact that the Basie band had a very distinct the whole band had a per, very personal sound. Definitely. Uh, I want to ask you, <clears throat> what groups do you see existing today, if there are any, that approximate that kind of personal sound that that you've come to like and enjoy in the Basie band? You mean is anyone, uh, are there any groups or sp specific artists that you think? are perpetuating what jazz is really about today. Certainly. Uh, Could you there, name a couple of your favorites? Of, uh, young groups, you know, like uh, uh, Terrence Blanchard. Uh, of course, the Elvin Jones group has, uh, ha has makes use of a lot of youngsters, such as Nicholas Payton and um, 
even used Coltrane's son, Ravi Coltrane, with Elvin Jones. And of course, uh, uh, Vincent Herring, an alto saxophonist, Jesse Davis, another alto saxophonist, Bobby Watson, another alto saxophonist, Roy like Hargrove, Chris McBride, um, uh, Antonio Hart. These are the youngsters that are, that are, that are carrying on authentic jazz. This is not the bassy style now. I'm talking uh -huh. about small group jazz. Uh -huh. And uh, there, there, there are many others that are doing the Harper brothers. They, they broke up as a group, but uh, the two of them are, they're doing like the straight ahead jazz. And, uh, and if you're speaking of big bands that, are, that have distinctive sounds, there are, there are a few of those around. Uh, but y y your question wasn't related, relating to other bands doing the basic thing. No, no not necessarily doing the basic oh, okay. thing. Yeah. But in and other just words, on it just, yeah. just putting your thumb on the pulse and saying, is, is, is the, are the traditions alive and well? Yeah, I would say the traditions are alive and well. Illinois Jacket has a band that's a very good band. And of course, he's from the old school. And uh, the arrangements are... are from that same school, and a lot of guys are uh, in that generation, mixed with younger guys who are really doing it very well. Then there are some bands around New York. Well, uh, I don't know how you you rate uh, Toshiko Akiyoshi, but as far as I'm concerned, she's an excellent writer, and she gets a lot of great uh, sounds, colors, and textures mm. out of that band. Then. Uh, the GRP All-Star Band has got a wonderful sound. Um, How often does that band play, though? I don't know. I don't know. If they, I, I don't, think they're all together. Yeah, I think they just get together and record, yeah. and then that's the last you, mm -hmm. you see of them. I don't know if they make in-person uh Yeah, I think most of those guys have individual careers that they're pursuing. Yeah, that's pursuing. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have the uh, Carnegie Hall Band under the direction of uh, John Faddis, the Lincoln Center Orchestra, under the direction of Wynton Marsalis. These are perpetuating different styles, like from Jelly Roll Morton to Louis Armstrong to Fats Waller to Duke Ellington, uh, et cetera, et cetera, Basie. And uh, they're sort of uh, repertory orchestras. I think the Smithsonian but, has one as well. Smithsonian, yes, uh, with uh, Doug, uh, Doug Harris, which we just mm -hmm. saw him in. Uh, not Doug Harris, Doug Richards. Doug Why Richards, do I say Doug yeah. Harris? <laughs> Doug Richards from VCU. Yeah, I know that. Smithsonian, yeah. yeah. And he Have does a that, wonderful job. Uh, what do they call that band that he puts together? I'm not sure of the name of it. Oh. They do a lot of uh, uh, old, you know. Yeah, yeah, the traditional. I understand uh, he has, a, he has a, an insight to a lot of the uh, original charts. Because they were, you know, yes, yes, he does, he does. Yeah. He, yeah, he's the right person for that job. He does a wonderful job with that. So it's going on. Yeah, you know, it's still there going are some on. bands around New York. Maria Schneider is a lady who has a kicking band, and she does some wonderful writing. Is that is that that's not Diva? No, I don't think that's, that's Diva. Another, Diva. That's another. Yeah, yeah that's an old. That's another. old Girl, oh woman. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't John the Barber write for them? He may. I, I, think haven't, so. I haven't heard I that. I think man. so. Yeah, yeah. He just, he just may. Can you tell us about uh, writing for Joe Williams and if you wrote for a certain style for him and what it was like to work with him when he was with the band? Yeah, it was great working with him because uh, he uh, he like Sarah Vaughan usually let me have free free hand, free reign, and just uh, he'd let me have the lyrics and he'd sing them down for me and, and uh, give me an idea of basically the kind of uh, backing he wanted and let me go for myself from there. Because I, I used to pride myself on being able to really write some bassy type blues. And uh, and you did. I have that album. They're it's expanding. Like arrangements, right? On the Basie Swings and Joe Williams. Oh, Joe Williams sings Basie Swings. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was 
Thad Jones also did some wonderful work for Joe. Yeah. As well as Ernie Wilkins. Mm -hmm. Ernie Wilkins, <laughs> he wrote the big, the arrangement of the big hit every day. Yes, and there's another did. one called Five O'Clock in the Morning. Did you know, did you know wow. huh? that that every day started out as a head tune? You remember when Joe Williams joined the band and we took that southern swing? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I remember that we, a lot of the licks that, that Ernie put into every day, we'd already mm -hmm. like, like set those things. Right. You know, and he wrote them in. And then there were two songs that were heads from from Jump Day City. One. Yeah. Uh, I got a guy, uh, Roland P. Roland P. And, uh, and uh, Shake Rattle Shake and Roll. And roll. Mm -hmm. Not a note of music written for either of those. Not they were ever. Full fledged arrangements. Yeah. I mean, the audience would never know the difference. That that was uh, going back to the old days in the best way possible. Totally. Um, from the head. Then there was a recording that we did. Now this this wasn't this is all off the subject of Joe Williams. Um, remember when they had the M Squad, uh, that detective story, on television. Um, they wanted a theme for the for for M Squad, and they came to me unfortunately, and they brought me a sketch of. Uh, Somebody from the studio had written this dumb sketch, and I was supposed to make something of it. And uh, it wasn't a blues, it wasn't, it was just like eight bars of some nonsense. And I said, now, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> and I labored over this mess, and I tried to make something out of it. And I said, man, I just, I'm just not one for taking ideas of others and turning them into something, especially when they... <laughs> <laughs> I can't use the word left-handed. Yes. Well, it's, yeah, it's worse one. than that. Yeah, right. <laughs> worse than that. <laughs> so we got in the studio and they ran it down and and it's well, uh, I don't know. We're looking for something. Uh, uh, so Thad Jones, Frank West, and I put our heads together, and Thad did most of the work. It was you play this note, you play this. And let's take this little riff and we play this and you and they came out with the M Squad theme with not a note of music oh written, totally a head tune. Ba 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 do rip ba 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 do rip something. You know what that really sounded like. Well that's what it was. Yeah, that's that's how it started out. You know what's a direct rip off on that? What's this that? 33 and a third detective? Yeah. It's a direct rip off. Is that right? Yeah, the yeah, naked, gun, naked, naked gun. gun. Naked gun. Naked gun. Oh, direct, uh, direct uh, direct naked gun. Rip -off. Yeah, right. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, that, uh, I don't know who did name. the arrangement on this. No, one, yeah, right. Direct direct Leslie Nielsen. Yeah, Borrowed pretty heavily, huh? Oh. Yeah. Man. All the way. Mm. Well, I wanted to ask you something about that and have you just make a comment on this. Um, can you give us some of your insights when you talk about head arrangements with no written music and people just doing it out of their own experience of knowing the music, somebody starting a riff and the next person automatically knows where that lays on the horn and, and how to pick that up in unison and then how to split it in harmony. Mm -hmm. Or the Barry Sachs automatically knows to play a lower guide tone line to that. Uh, can you talk to us about how jazz is a manifestation of oral culture and, 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 wow, and, and, or, and a blending of oral culture and literate culture? Well, you have to go back to the call and response idea. You know, uh, that's part of our oral history, right? The call and response. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in music, in jazz, uh, the trumpets may set one riff. Uh, the saxophones will respond by filling in the blank spaces. They might, trumpets might say, da 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 ba ba da ba 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 da ba ba da ba 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 ba
the trumpets are playing something up high and you want to have a response to that on a masculine level and the trumpets are sounding like the female, then you come in and make your statement behind them to answer like, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you know? And uh, that's the ad kind of an attitude you have to have. Uh -huh. you know? Like when the trumpet says something, you got to get in there and get your thing going, you know, and it's just like he says, the call and response. But it's, it, to me, it's always been the male-female type thing, you know, yeah. female talking, the male answers, mm -hmm. and I don't know, the reed section kind of mediates the <laughs> brass section. <laughs> <laughs> stuck in the middle. Yeah. You know, you're saying something here that I think is very rich. You know, what you just said right now, the first thing, the is response that it got from, from me and Monk has made us laugh because oh, yeah. of the insight of it. You know, yeah. the, the insight that you, you give the male, male female thing, yeah. call and response thing. Mm. Every time you talk about call and response, I think of a, a choir and a preacher. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, the, but the other thing I was saying is, see, so little of this is taught in schools. Well, it's that's, hard to teach, though. that's one people. thing that uh, Frank has been trying to do with this band is try to go into schools and tell people how the thing was really done, not from an edu not from a, uh, I won't say an educational standpoint. You mean the music but from, Yeah, not from that the theoretical, theoretical standpoint, stand, yeah. but from, you know, like the feeling standpoint. And uh, we've been, well, we have this particular thing that we do at Hampton University where all these little bands come in and they play their thing and Frank and a few of the other guys critique these bands. And they particularly home in on the feeling that the peep, that the kids are getting, you know, because that's the one thing that they do miss. I mean, they're getting all this stuff in the schools, but they don't get the, you know, yeah. the, the basic, you gotta have a feeling to play this thing. You know, let's try to express ourselves the way we feel, not what, not only what the notes are saying, but how you feel about those notes, right. you know? And uh, we'd like to spread that around more, but, uh, it doesn't happen as often as we would like. Yeah. I think there's a you know big part of of teaching that's sometimes left out is, is just dealing with hearing and yeah. and playing yeah. Yeah. something yeah. from in here where uh, instead of off a sheet of paper. But mm. You know, Ruth. We were talking with Ruth, and basically what she said was, you know, when you play these notes, these notes are expensive. The notes cost you something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an emotional price tag mm -hmm. to those notes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. Very well. That's put. yeah. That, you can't put it any better than that. <laughs> yeah. Very well stated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if anybody knows, she knows because yeah. you can hear her giving it out on you. Yeah. She told us some stories about traveling or something else. And she did. Uh, she did an album with one of the greatest jazz bands in the history of this country, as far as I was concerned, was the Thad Jones, yeah. Mel Lewis band. Yeah. And she did an album, man, that was just killing. It really was. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it still is. <laughs> right. yeah. You have it? Yeah. You, oh, that's... man. Uh, yeah. I wonder, I can't, I have to ask you about shiny stockings. No. Oh. I mean, that's a great piece. How did that, do you remember, can you remember, like, how that thing start? With a pair of shiny stockings. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a story behind the title. Tell us a story behind the title. <laughs> well, see, now, this involves my first wife. And uh, I'm not uh, inclined to talk, speak too well of her. <laughs> tell us about the chart. <laughs> okay. No, let it tell yeah, the story. Yeah, the chart was in, inspired okay. by right. my first wife mm -hmm. uh, putting on stockings. This was uh, in 1954, BPH, before pantyhose. <laughs> 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 when stockings were really stockings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. With all guard of belts and all that. The other appendages, yes, guard of belts. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> but, uh, and they used to, you know, she'd put them on and she'd stand and the light would hit her legs in a certain way and it just the phrase shiny stocking just came to me 
looking at this repeatedly, repeatedly. Mm -hmm. You know, you, something happens to you long enough, you'll get an idea about it. <laughs> and so I put it into a song. But, but the really significant part of the, the history of that song is that uh, I labored over the arrangement. I made sure that every note was just right in the right place. And the first time we rehearsed it was in Pep's Bar in Philadelphia. Mm. And we had come in that day and the band was tired and evil. <laughs> Everybody wanted to get some rest and nobody felt like rehearsing. And I just can't for the life of me figure out why Basie insisted on this rehearsal. But customarily we rehearsed the first day, uh, the opening day in, in any club that was a week or two weeks or more, we, we'd rehearsed the first day of the engagement. Well, this first day, no one felt like rehearsing, and I brought shiny stockings in. And the, the way the guys felt uh, was manifested in the way they played this song. And I said, oh, God, well, this, this will never be played, because if something didn't sound good in rehearsal, Basie mixed it. <laughs> it just wouldn't get played. Mm. Shiny Stockings did not sound good in that first rehearsal, but Chief must have heard something there. He must have realized that, well, the guys are all evil and tired, and they're not putting their 100%, but there's something in there. He must have, because that's one of the few charts that I ever contributed to the book that Basie, years later, came to me and said, hey, Foss, that's Shiny Stockings. He said, you're really putting one down that time. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the way you would have said that. <laughs> Mm. Right. And of course, you know, that's, that's uh, like, you know, a standard now. Everybody plays it everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're a college big band, you haven't played China Stockings, you don't know the repertoire. <laughs> <you know? laughs> that must make you feel good, doesn't it? Certainly. Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel like, very good. Like I think about uh, guys uh, trying to tell guitar players to do a certain thing or doing a swing tune, and you say, now do that Freddie Green thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's such a contribution yeah. that uh, it's something to be really proud of. I did that rehearsal today yeah. to Steve Primus. <laughs> you know what you were talking about? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you did a, a solo, what was that, to Magic? Did you play that? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was, a, that was a, I think, a blues that Frank West. Mm -hmm. Frank West was that. Yeah, that's magic. what we used yeah. to call him. Yeah, magic. Right, that oh. was his name. He, it still yeah. is his nickname. I'm kidding. Yeah. I have to remember yeah. that when magic. we see him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, every now and then I got a chance to stand up and play, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to go back and ask you one thing, if you could elaborate on this. You talked about your times uh, traveling to Europe. Mm. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can relate anything to the way that African Americans were treated in Europe. Uh, the stories that I've heard so far is that, that they were treated much better, given real treatment like an artist, as compared to some of the early years in jazz here. And I was kind of wanting you to, if you could compare that to the way that we treat European orchestral conductors over here. Well, I'm not completely aware of how they com how they treat the uh, orchestral conductors over here, but I know for sure that we were welcomed to Europe in a different way, you know, and uh, they had a a basic respect for jazz, especially during those fifties and sixties, uh, that the Americans just didn't have, you know, and that's when jazz was fading fast in this country. And uh, you, you would go to um, Europe, and everybody would know all about you. You know, they'd know your whole history. And uh, they'd be lining up for autographs outside the place like, you know, like they do for rock stars over here. And it's, it was just a different feeling. Of course, it's changing fast now. But, uh, that thing about uh, being treated more like an artist rather than just a a musician. That's very true. Very, very true. They treated uh, American jazz uh, like a, a revered product from another land as we treat European classical music mm -hmm. here. And uh, they 
realized early on that this was the classical music of um, America. Of America, that's true. And in most of the major cities at one time or another, they had what you called radio bands. Now, that's hardly ever been heard of in the United States, a radio band. We had television orchestra, the Tonight Show Orchestra, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Merv Griffin, and all people like that had bands, but radio band, and they and and even some of those radio bands are still uh, in existence today. I just did a, a job with one of them last uh, back in November, and uh, it's called SDR, the South German Radio Band. Wonderful group of musicians. I mean, they know what the tradition is all about. And a bunch of swinging Europeans. I think mm. they've got this happening. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I went there and I was right at home. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in answer to your question, yeah, the treatment of African Americans um, has been wonderful. And uh, going back to the days when the United States did not uh, treat us as well. It's so wonderful that a lot of People were persuaded to move there. That's right. You know, Ben Webster, John Bias, mm -hmm. Coleman Hawkins. Uh, now some have come back. You know, Slide Hampton lived over there for years. Um, I think Johnny Griffin still lives over there. Mm. How about Art Farmers? He, Art he Farmers is, is uh, as far as I know, he's still a resident of mm. Vienna. Mm. But I don't, I don't know if he came back or not. And there are some. Uh, Others like um, Ed Thigpen, yeah, Ed, Ed Thigpen, yes, and of course Kenny Clark, uh, the late Wilkins. Kenny Clark, uh, the late uh, Leo Wright, who yeah. played with Dizzy, yeah, and uh, there were some great uh, musicians that got jobs in the studio. Herb Geller, an alto saxophonist, hmm. a white American, mm -hmm. when he went over there, and so did uh, uh, Sal Nistico. Sal Mystico. Sal Mystico and, uh, He's from you. Uh, yeah. One of those Jeez, bad upstate New Yorkers, oh. boy. Mm -hmm. There's some energy around here yeah. that has persisted down through the sea. Nick Brignola. Nick Brignola, yeah. Sammy Noto, um, oh, uh, the, uh, of course, the Mangione brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, uh, oh, man. Steve Gadd. Steve, Steve Gadd, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, yeah, so around the Utica, yeah. Schenectady, Syracuse, Rochester area. A whole lot of uh, uh, special energy going on. And then Paisanos, boy. Yeah, that's right. Good pasta did it, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you a question. Tell us a little bit about your group, The Loud Minority. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Loud Minority. <laughs> Undisciplined, <clears throat> unbridled. Passion, <laughs> rage, <laughs> happy rage. Uh -huh. uh, There's a quote. Uh, that was the most undisciplined group of men and women. I had uh, two ladies in and out of that band, and uh, instrumentalists, not vocalists. You know, had male and female vocalists, but lady instrumentalists: Janice Robinson, the trombonist, and Sharon Freeman, a French horn and pianist, uh, but uh, we were characterized by our inability to play soft oh. <laughs> for long. Maybe you I got to play it soft. That way, didn't you? I didn't plan it that way, it just happened. <laughs> you know, and, and everybody was a soloist. <laughs> we didn't uh, omit anybody from the <laughs> solo category. And <laughs> there were some who weren't that proficient at soloing. But I insisted that they just try to get it together. And there were even some who, who soloed on songs that they had no business playing on. There was one guy who played trumpet. He should never have played Shiny Stockings, <laughs> but he did it. He played his solo on Shiny Stockings, and every time he got <laughs> this from the audience. I said, well, what can I do? I can't take it away from him. But uh, uh, they. They would listen to my wife, Cecilia, but they wouldn't listen to me. 
If I, you know, I cuss them out, I do the Illinois Jack Kellogg. Y'all sounded like, <laughs> y'all didn't do this, y'all didn't do this. Yeah, yeah. So one set, they get together and they would be perfect, they would be together. And the next set, the unbridled, undisciplined rage would return. <laughs> That's the first time I heard it put like that, folks. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got several, I got a whole bunch of uh, fugitives from the loud minority infiltrating the, the world out there. <laughs> and one of these days, we're going to take over. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> on that note, um, I know you guys got to get up early. And uh, I wish we could talk all night, but... Oh, hell, let's talk all night. <laughs> yeah, let's talk all night. <laughs> you you got to start it. We won't be scratch the surface of this jazz. Know. Uh, you, you can talk for You me. didn't let us tell any Joe Williams stories. Well, no. Joe Williams. Oh, we got to get a Joe I'm Williams story. I'm only okay. kidding. Well, there's, there's one Joe Williams story that uh, comes to mind where uh, he was singing this torchy ballad, you know, and... They were, in the old days, in the, in the little cabarets, uh, male vocalists, fe female vocalists especially, some of them would like, you know, jump up on the piano to sing the ballad and take the mic with them and, and they jump up on the piano and they'd cross their ankles and sing and everybody would just groove along with it. Well, this is one time, I don't know where we were, but Joe Williams tried to jump up on that piano and didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and he tried again and again oh, and no. still didn't make it. And so Frank West, Frank West has got a laugh that you can hear forever. You know, like on a clear day, you can hear Frank West laugh forever. And he started laughing, and it was infectious, the whole band. So Joe finally gave up and then stood up and sang the song like he should have in the first place. You know, Joe? Nobody watching that. That's good. <laughs> got anything else you want to add? And for us, it's been great. Well, I only remember one thing in particular about Joe. Joe came into this band, uh, I think the day after Christmas in 1954. He and Sonny Payne came Sonny in Payne on the same day. day. And they started being roommates. And you have never seen the odder couple and those two, you know, I mean, the stories that came from that union were enough to fill a book. Mm. And uh, I mean, I could, you know, like say all night long about things that they did that were just awesomely funny. But uh, Joe transformed this band from like a, 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 a great band that was working but not making a lot of money, and to a great band that was working and making a lot of money. That's how, you know, yeah. He, he really did that much because once we recorded every day and what was that, uh, Roland Pete and uh, Come Teach, back. Me Teach Me Tonight. Yeah. All that stuff seemed like it just hit all at once, you know. And all of a sudden we were working in all these places and. The, Crowds were there, you know, and we were making money, and their basic was happy, and the band was happy having fun. We weren't making any money, but <laughs> the band was happy, you know. And the words of the Count Basie and Joe Williams were, were magic. There was a guaranteed full house lines around the corner. Yeah, Count that's right. Count Basie, Joe Williams. That's it. That was it. It just transformed the whole thing. In the late 50s. And, and so what you're saying there is between musicians, even after your skill levels have reached a point where people don't even question your skills anymore, still there are special times where there's chemistry. Oh, yeah. Between certain Definitely. people. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that was, that was it. The band and Joe Williams came together at that particular moment, and that was history after that. It was just history. Can I ask you one last question? Can, do, did you know at that time, could you sense at that time, very early on, that this, I, this, I, is, this is going to be in the Groves Dictionary of Jazz later no, on? No, no, we were, we were, we were, we were thinking, I don't think we were thinking in a historical perspective when, 
when that happened. We were more into a selfish mode about what does this mean to us in mm. terms of, sure. of what we're playing now, <laughs> you know. Uh, I kind of had a feeling that, did you? that, that musical history was being made. Well, after the record I did, you know, uh -huh. because I'd be walking down the street and all I'd hear is, did you say I got a lot to learn? It was all over the place, you know, everywhere uh -huh. I'd go. And then every day, I said, damn, we're, we're everywhere now, you know, I'm yes, part of something here. I was and, uh, very happy to be a part of it. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, it was just a, a, a feeling, especially for me, that Sonny Payne hit the, hit the thing right on the head that we right. needed right at that point. More so right. than Joe Williams to me, you know? Mm, just as well. Although I did, it didn't really ring, ring into me on Joe Williams until I heard those records <laughs> being played all over the place. But Sonny, Sonny, like, he had a knack for booting this band. Yeah, but, uh, and plus he was visual. Yeah, he was he, very visual. You know, the thing with the juggling the sticks, throwing the sticks up and catching them and hitting right on the uh, given beat. And that was, uh, when, you, when you catch an audience with a visual extravaganza as well as a, a oral or musical. And there we were yeah. with two of the, you know, and Joe and Sonny yeah. were two of the most yeah. colorful characters in the band, uh -huh. which was full of colorful characters. Uh -huh. <laughs> Every, everybody had a story. Yeah. Everybody is. And then when we acquired uh, the likes of Snooky Young to play lead trumpet. Yeah. And we that had was Joe a, Newman and Pat. I think that was the final piece when Snooky That was, that was the icing on the cake. Yeah. And that was arguably the greatest of all Basie bands. Mm. Yeah. That was the New Testament band. Yeah. The Old Testament band being the band from the late 30s and the early 40s. In the late 40s, it wasn't such, it was good, but it wasn't. It wasn't it as was, polished as, as uh, the band in the late Right, right, because we developed into a, a precision, a slick precision East Coast jazz machine, mm. but still, uh, lots of feeling. Yeah. Uh -huh. The feeling we never the, the feeling yeah. never left. Uh -huh. So the precision and the polish came and and the feeling, you know, that just was just steamrolled over people. Yeah. <laughs> With Joe Williams and Sonny Payne there too. Yeah. And Marsha Roy playing lead out. I mean mm, what a he was yeah. see the voice of the band was Marsha Roy, Snooky Young and Henry Coker, the lead players. Mm. And together they gave the band one hellified voice. Yes, they did. And then with the with you're the, making me cry. With the Freddie course. Green, <laughs> with the, <laughs> the Freddie Green metronomic, but still loose, happy uh, rhythm. Uh huh. And Eddie Jones, yeah. who who acquired a technique of walking the bass that was just phenomenal. And then Sonny Payne with the power and, that he gave to it. The All American Rhythm Section of the late fifties. Mm. And hey, it was a great time to be alive. It really was, yeah. and a great time to be young. Yeah. You know, like in the like I was in my early twenties to, to from twenty four till about thirty two years of age. Yeah. That was right in the meat of my of party time. You know, whereas, <laughs> man. You, know whereas you tend to think of think of old time bands as being old musicians. You know. What's, yeah. What was really happening right. is that these bands were young bands, yeah. you know. Right. Even Bass's first band, those were young guys out there, right. mm -hmm. you know, doing that stuff. Right. And you tend to think of, you know, like the kind of music they were playing. You said, you know, oh, yeah, that's when those old cats were playing. But they weren't old cats. Those were young cats that's right. playing the music of their time, you know. What's this thing about a Papa Floss? I heard that song the other day. No, that's what the thing about Papa is. <laughs> it's a, a, a pianist by the name of Danny Mixon who played with me, uh, my, my small group, and he was, he's a loud minority, so you know he's Spacekovich, <laughs> like we all were. <laughs> and he composed this song called Papa Foss. Do, 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 Papa Foss. So he, he didn't have any lyrics to it. So my wife Cecilia and I got together and we put the lyrics to this song. Yeah. And I sold Carmen Bradford on the idea of singing it. Yeah. And uh, of course, it put me out front, you know. 
standing out in front of it is Papa Foss. Bearing <laughs> all in front of it was Papa Foss. So it, it showed me off in very good light. <laughs> so, and I was very happy that she uh, agreed to sing it. And well, we got we got recorded. Yeah. And uh, it's it's in the annals, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> yeah, they've been playing it in uh, Syracuse. They have they? Yeah, Is they that do. right? Yeah, yeah, they got a good jazz station. We uh oh, that's good to know. We we don't we don't play it anymore. That Carmen's not with the uh -huh. with the band, because uh, that's a that was that was her song. I mean, she she put something on it that I don't think anyone else could. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, we had uh, a trumpet battle between Bob Ojeda and the very brilliant Melton Mustafa, and they just took it to great <laughs> levels. <laughs> I forgot and that it was, part. Uh, yeah, it was something mm -hmm. else. Uh, but uh, people don't call me that too much anymore, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just be happy to be called Foss. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to thank you, gentlemen, and uh, Frank Foster currently leading the bassy orchestra and tenor soprano sax, and Bill Hughes holding down the bass trombone chair. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and thanks a lot for your stories. Well, it's been it's our pleasure. pleasure, too. I think the bassy band is in good hands. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. All right. <laughs> All right.